there's a couple thoughts I have on my mind today, and I'm still not sure which one I want to talk about. One was, is God a nice God? And the other one, for some reason, has left me. Oh, that's what it was. This came to me. It's about the character of our God. I was listening to the Bible reading today. It's an absolutely amazing story about King Ahab and the prophet Micaiah. And I think it says a lot about his character and a lot about our character. And so just to briefly sum it up, King Ahab wanted to do something and God wanted to do something too. King Ahab wanted to do something evil and God wanted King Ahab to uh, be destroyed, no longer exist. In other words, take himself down, so to speak. So all his prophets say, go into this one battle and you will profit, you will win. It'll all be good. And they're being led by this one prophet, Zedekiah. I don't know, I might talk about him in a minute or not, but God shows Micaiah this vision where God is on his throne and all the host of heaven is before him. And he's asking for ideas on how to bring down Ahab. And the writer says that one said this and one said that. And then one steps up and says, hey, I, I can do it. And God says, what do you do? He says, I'll put a lying spirit in the mouths of all of Ahab's prophets. So now Micaiah has this information. Ahab has already heard what the mouths of his lying prophets have had to say. And Jehoshaphat happens to be there and says, is there anyone that says something besides what these guys say? I'm paraphrasing Jehoshaphat. But he says, do you have any prophets that say anything other than this? And Ahab says, oh, there's one, Micaiah. But I basically keep him locked up because he always says bad things. I don't like what he says. So they bring Micaiah in and, and he had been admonished by a friend. Please say something good to the king this time. And I guess he took that advice in a sarcastic way. The, the king brings Micaiah up and says, shall I go up to, I forget what is it? Beth Gilead or something like that. That's where the battle was. So I go there and, and Micaiah says, yes, the king shall prosper. Go ahead. <laughs> but I thought it's kind of funny when you think about it. God already told him that that's what the liars are saying. I don't know if it was sarcasm or if he was just joining in on the ruse. But anyway, Ahab says, basically, again, I'm paraphrasing it. Come on, Micaiah, we all know that you just say whatever the Lord tells you to say, which is amazing to me too, because he's acknowledging that what Micaiah says is gonna be true. It's just that he doesn't like it. So, he tells him the account of what I just told you, that he saw the Lord on his throne and, and he's asking for advice and the one, the one spirit, the one angel, said, I'll put a lying spirit in the mouths of all of Ahab's prophets. God says, go ahead and do it. That'll work. That'll get Ahab. And Ahab looks at the host guy and says, see, I told you. He never tells me nothing but bad stuff. And Zedekiah, by the way, comes and smacks uh, old Micaiah upside the head. It says, you know, something to the effect of, when did the spirit of God leave me to go to you? And Ahab tells his servants, you know, throw, throw this bomb, throw Micaiah in the prison and give him the bread and water of affliction till I return in peace. And the guy says, if you return in peace, God hasn't spoken by me. You know, in so many words, he's basically said, you ain't coming back, brother. This is your doom. You're about to go die. And the thing I want to focus on is the story carries out a stray arrow finds Ahab and mortally wounds him. And he dies according to the prophecy. According to what God said to Micaiah, and Micaiah told Ahab, who believed Micaiah was a true prophet, told him, it all happens. And then it just goes on, continuing on with more stories about Jehoshaphat. 
it's just there. It's just a fact. There's a story. It happened. And people can take it for what it is. And I was thinking in terms of his character in terms in relation to glory, the glory of God. What is glorious? And we all tend to think it's oh, it's trumpets and angels and choirs and people singing and glory, glory, glory to God and holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And those are things that I think are just going to come out of us when we see him. It's not going to be something we're going to say, oh, there's God. I better, you know, it's just going to pour out of you. You're not going to be able to help it. And glory and honor is, you know, there's many aspects and facets of that. But as it pertains to his character, his character, he didn't, he didn't use that to say, hey, look at me, ain't I a great God? He just did it. It's an amazing thing. And I didn't even mention all the things that I hope are obvious to you. May have had a chance to back out. He could have listened. He had been totally betraying God's kindness by giving him this crown and this throne. And I assume if he would have listened, he would have had mercy, even though he'd just been so disobedient, rotten and putrid in God's eyes up to then that God decided to kill him. He still had an out. I mean, how gracious is that? How amazing is that? But then Ahab doesn't listen and you know, God says, hey, don't do that. You're going to die. He doesn't. He dies. He doesn't lord it over anyone. He doesn't lord you know, over his family or anything. Or he doesn't go repeating it on and on throughout the Bible. Hey, remember what I did, Ahab? It's just, there it is. There's our God, our gracious God, our loving God, our kind God, our patient God. And somebody said, well, we have to be more gracious. Everyone around warning us all the time. Reminding us of what could happen. Really, folks? Really? Do we really need that? I mean, I'm talking about believers here. I'm not talking about atheists or Buddhists or communists or whatever it is you are that, that doesn't accept the God of the Bible. I'm saying, if you believe in the God of the Bible, he's given you a wonderful testimony and plenty of reasons to believe him. There's no reason why you should doubt him. I'm not saying you're a particularly evil person if you doubt him. We all have our moments. I'm just saying... Don't look at him and say, wow, why didn't you tell me, God? You know, the thing is, is he still suffers us. He still suffers our poor manners. He saw how we were when we were here. I mean, I don't know how real this is to people. I don't know if it's real enough to me. But I realize that on some level that he walked here in the flesh. The God of all creation, the creator of the universe, walked on earth with us, with you, with me, to see, feel, hear, taste, touch, experience the things that you and I experience and the way that we experience them. Well, that's condescension and the most beautiful way anyone can ever imagine. And he didn't lord that over us. He is so gracious and his character is so kind and so patient and loving you know obviously it doesn't look too good for Ahab I, I would have to think but there's a lot of people well maybe not a lot but some people think well, hey well Judas was saved he served his purpose and uh, he definitely repented after the fact that for those of you who believe repentance is what it's all about his final his final act on this earth was that of contrition of repentance however you want to put that he definitely repented. Ananias and Sapphira, some people think they went to hell. They are believers. If they're believers, then they are saved, and they are saved. Eternal salvation is eternal. But the thing is, is I, 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 I'm trying to focus on more in my life, and I, and I hope to be able to show that to people, is the graciousness of our God. We tend to think automatically that, well, oh yeah, boom, yeah, that guy, straight to hell. But we're all that guy. At one point or another, whoever you think is that evil guy, you know, we've all been Ahab. We've all been whoever your Bible, favorite Bible figure to laugh at and mock or, or say that's the worst dude. You know, we, we've all been on, on some level, some degree. We've all done that. But the character of our God 
is just to, to be God. And part of being God is loving, patience, kindness, graciousness. Think about that. Think about how gracious your God is in general. Just the takeaway from this is the long suffering of our God. You think, well, geez, why not just smite Ahab? He's asking the angels, what should I do? Why don't you just hit him with a lightning bolt? No, no, he, he, he participates in our lives. Of course, he could live our lives for us, and there's a lot live our lives for us. But there, and there's a lot of people that think that he does, that he literally does every single thing, and we're just kind of like puppets along for the ride. So this is a guy on the radio today, and he said that, oh God, there's everything. If you have you're, you got a boss who's a real jerk, God did it. That's for a good reason. You'll figure it out sometime. Whatever it is, you're sick. You know, he's focusing on the negatives. I'm sure he talks about the good stuff too sometimes, but today was his day to focus on the negatives and all the negatives were God ordained, God orchestrated. God literally choreographs all these things. And I just don't see it that way. I see it that he participates, he's in there, and he can also just say, okay, I'll let him figure it out. Or I, I spoke to him and they didn't listen and now that now they're going to suffer the consequences. Did God kill Adam and Eve? No, of course he didn't. And he doesn't do anything to us in that respect. He doesn't have to. We do it to ourselves. And he's still there. He's still there. He's always still there. He never, as long as you're alive anyway, you know, if you ain't saved and you're alive, there's still hope for you. People say that ain't true too. Oh, no deathbed. Who are you? Say there's no deathbed confession. That's up to God. And I'm sure he does it all the time because he loves different than we do. He has a graciousness that is beyond anything we can imagine. Think about that when you read the scriptures. Think about that when you look at your life. When you think things are going bad and you're thinking, why God? Really seriously think about all the dumb things you've done and you've done some stupid things. Trust me, I know I'm a human being. And I've done the dumbest stuff. I feel like Paul. I feel like, man, I'm the chief of all sinners. And, and the fact that he would even look at me is a miracle of grace and kindness. And it, and it shows me the depths of his heart. You can become aware and get an insight into the depths of the heart of your God and Father. Just by, by having a perspective, considering and thinking, wow, God, you're amazing. Look at that story, Ahab. Wow, yeah. But the other one with the talking donkey. You know, wasn't that something? Balaam was just giving him all kinds of mess. And God puts up with it. God is gracious. God is kind. God is loving. Be aware of that. Be aware of how little you deserve and how much you get. Because it's tremendous. It is absolutely astonishing what we get from our God. Every single day. I don't know what kind of life you live. But if you live a life with physical dangers or you know someone who does. And and you, you, you can probably tell stories of the mishaps, the close calls, the near deaths. You live long enough in this world. That's God. It's his angels. It's his love. It's his kindness. It's in helping us to get another shot at it. You know Jesus, you know an amazing God. Be happy for that. And, uh, and rest in that. No, he loves you. He does those things because he loves you. He's not doing those things so he can wait to give you the final countdown, count you out, say, get out of my sight. No, he's, he's drawing you. He's a wonderful God, amazing God. Not like him. I mean, I almost feel redundant just saying that. That's so obvious, so silly. And unlike him, there's none beside him. There's only him. In Jesus' name, amen.